um, welcome back to another video. We're looking at the Denon DRR M7. This cassette deck has a form factor that's very similar to a CD-ROM or DVD drive from a desktop computer, and it loads that way too, in a tray. This is not really a typical loading mechanism for a cassette. What do you think about that? That's pretty cool and yeah. easy. It all seems so perfectly simple. I suppose one just presses that and out it pops. Put it back, Mr. Bone. Inside this thing is a totally computer-controlled cassette deck crammed with circuit boards and one of those flip auto-reverse heads. <laughs> And it has Dolby BC and HX Pro and Music Search. But one question that comes to mind is why put such a fancy loading mechanism on this deck when everything else feels so cheap? Look at these buttons. They're just dinky little plastic things shoved over to one side, not laid out well. And the tape direction is actually the opposite of the arrow you're pressing, which is weird. Well, the answer is conformity. This deck is part of a personal component system, a mini system offered by Denon, which each component is styled to be the same. Denon offered several different types of these systems in the 1990s. Why is that guy smoking? Why is that guy smoking? Well, he's the boss. He's like the suit. In this 1998 review, they were called executive systems, which are for anyone who's short on space but wants decent sound. And the review gave the Denon system very high marks. Of the eight systems reviewed, the Bang & Olsen was the winner. It cost $700 more than the Denon, but according to the review, sounded only slightly better. Another thing to consider when evaluating the bare bones nature of this deck is the time frame. In 1998... Uh yeah, it's a pirate. In 1998, MP3 was already here. Napster was right around the corner. Minidisc was still being promoted. By 1998, I was already well into CD burning and still bothering to use cases and labels, although that would go by the wayside soon enough as they became cheaper and more disposable. Incidentally, the oldest CD I found was from 96 and it still works fine. No laser rod here. So let's move on to the repair. So the eBay description for this said it would not power up and they were right. Very dead, Mr. Spock. No lights, no buttons, nothing did anything. When I took it apart, I found a very modular system made up of various circuit boards that plugged into each other with connectors and cables. I never found a service manual. These labels are from another one. I did all the obvious things. I checked the fuses. I ran the uh, transport mechanism through its paces and verified that the switches actually changed continuity. And uh, with any cassette deck, you need to check the belts, and they were fine as well. But when I had the tape transport mechanism out and plugged in, I found something very interesting happened. The motor turned on for a few seconds. This led me to take another look at the lights, and sure enough, the standby light was flickering on for a second as well. So I went on a search for power, thinking maybe the power supply was not outputting something or something was sucking it down, but I found 5 volts regulated on the control panel and 11.92 volts on a jumper labeled 12 volts. So this was very strange for something that would not power up. When I was just staring at the thing, thinking about it, the answer hit me. There's a huge gaping hole in the circuit board. So I began a to... scam! <gasps> I don't know if it was a scam or not, because technically... Someone might, a, a, care, um, a um, clumsy guy dropped it. Yeah, it was dropped. That clearly took a chunk out of the circuit board. And looking at the lid of the thing, you can see where somebody hammered it back in. Because it's, it's popped up, not back down. You know, maybe not a scam. I don't know where it originally came from. But uh, things weren't looking good when I saw this. So first I identified the, ah. the gaping holes and, and just kind of bridged across all those with little wires. See, my dad's a genius. Uh, I went, no, not a genius. <laughs> I wish. I found five uh, connections that were missing and then hooked it all back together and it did this crazy stuff. It just, it didn't quite work right. It's The motor was still turning. Uh, it's like it didn't know what state it was in. She's dead, Jim. Uh, uh, she's not dead anymore. I figured like we're heading <laughs> the right direction. It would immediately eject after I closed it and I think it just didn't know what state it was in. And it was just randomly turning that the computer microprocessor didn't know. So I went back and looked closer and I found several additional hairline cracks that, that were there. And I sort of traced them to their uh, eventual destination. So I made two more additions to my wiring patches. Basically that thing on the top, uh, you know, that long orange wire had to go all the way to the end. I think what was happening is the signal from the cassette deck that told it what the state the switches were in was not getting to that connector, getting to the microprocessor board. And so once I did all that, I put it all back together and it, happened. Yes, it worked. Now it started working, although then I had this mysterious rattle. Rattle, rattle. Look at that. There was a mysterious rattle. Yeah, now when people shake in Morocco. 
Uh, I thought, okay, maybe something's, you know, worn down or whatever, but it was actually the, I guess the real deal. I've never seen that problem on the tape deck. After I fixed that, everything was fine. Looking at the the cheapness of the mechanism made me think, you know, hey, this the electronics on this thing are pretty robust, but the mechanics probably wasn't designed for a huge amount of use back in the day. See you next time for another awesome video.